Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm so delighted that I was able to get Mark and David together because both of these gentlemen are thoughtful. Uh, they're not partisans. Um, and I think you're going to get you're going to get something a little bit different tonight than you get on Fox or MSNBC. So sit back and enjoy it. Uh, let's start with a little bit of context, Mark. Um, you were working uh, doing the media for Senator John McCain's presidential campaign. But when then Senator Obama secured the Democratic nomination, you chose not to be part of the campaign for the rest of the year. Why was that? Well, I, I had met uh, Senator Obama uh, a couple of years prior to the presidential campaign, and I was impressed by his character, by his integrity. I didn't agree with a lot of his politics, but um, I thought that his campaign would be good for the country, and I, I, uh, I revered Senator McCain and uh, had always wanted to do something for him because he'd done so much for the country. Uh, and had gotten to know him uh, during the Bush presidential campaigns. And uh, so he asked me, we talked about my going to work for him in the, in the uh, 2008 race, and I was honored to do so. But the, the day I joined the campaign, I wrote a memo to him and to the, into the, the campaign team saying that, uh, that it was an honor and a privilege to, to work for Senator McCain, and I would do so with 100% of my ability. Uh, but that in the uh, off chance uh, that Senator McCain should get the Republican nomination and that Senator Obama would get the Democratic nomination, which, by the way, at that time seemed, <laughs> seemed uh, like a, a real long shot to actually happen, that if that happened, that I, I, would, uh, I would want to leave, uh, that I would want to uh, step back and not be part of the general election campaign. Because, not because I wouldn't be supporting John McCain. I would, and I did, and voted for John McCain. And, and he's still a very good friend of mine. Uh, and I still admire him greatly. But I didn't want to be part of a campaign that was inevitably going to have to attack uh, Senator Obama. Having been part of presidential campaigns before, I know what the general physics are. And I just wasn't comfortable doing that. And by the way, I also thought that it wasn't good for the campaign to have somebody like me in that slot, because you want somebody who's sort of a fierce advocate, uh, and I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel that strongly about it. I mean, I thought that while I, at the time, I certainly uh, had hoped for John McCain to be elected president. I thought that, as I said before, that that uh, Obama's candidacy would be a good thing for the country. So I stepped back, and, and when it actually happened that they both got the nomination, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do professionally because. As, as you know, it's a, it's, it's a real band of brothers and sisters, and you'd spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and so it was very hard to walk away, but Senator McCain, to his great credit, said, uh, I, I totally understand, and you made it clear when you joined the campaign, it would be very un-McCain-like not to honor your word, and thank you for helping me get here, and God bless you. So that's how it happened. I, I was curious when I read about this, and you and I haven't had a chance to talk about it, were you concerned that the, that the level of vitriol, the fierceness, would be even more extreme in this case? Or like you say, it's just part and parcel of presidential campaigns and it would just have to be at that level? I thought it, would, I th I thought it was just the general physics of the campaign, but I also thought because of the particular nature of the Obama candidacy that it would go places that would get pretty ugly, mm -hmm. and it did. Right. And, and I, you know, I'm really glad I made the decision that I did and that I wasn't part of it. Um, so both, both things are true, yeah. Most of my questions tonight are going to be for both of you gentlemen. So, David, I'll, I'll start with you on this, but, but Mark, I want you to react to this too. Democrats won huge victories, 06, 08. Um, things went so well in that historic 08 election that the Center for American Progress published uh, a, a fascinating piece. And I hope I'm saying his name right. If anybody is an expert on Portuguese, you can tell me if I'm saying this wrong. Rui Teixeira, right? Something close to that. It's called The New Progressive Majority. That was published in March of last year in, in which he essentially argued that progressivism was on the rise and that we were on the dawn of a progressive, at an age of progressive political control. What happened? Well, what happened is there were a number of caveats that he didn't pay attention to, I think, when he wrote the original piece and then in the, the follow-up work that was done um, about that subject. 
a lot of people chimed in. Um, you know, a lot of the things he, he was looking at were demographic. Um, so he was looking at a youth vote that he felt strongly was going to lean progressive and continue to lean progressive as they became a, a more and more dominant part of the electoral percentage. Um, and then he also saw non-white voters as consistently moving over uh, to join that. But I think what it all depended upon really was that this president would give that group of people an inspirational boost after the election. And that a lot of these folks, and in fact, a lot of the data that was used to, to write that piece established pretty clearly that, that these folks hadn't quite made up their mind. That they were in an age group that once they do make up their mind, they tend to not change their mind. People form their political opinions between the ages of 18 and 24, and they typically don't change them um, uh, for quite some time. And so the thought was, this is this great inspirational leader. He, he came in on this wave, and that these people would just follow him. Well, what has happened is, and we can argue about whether it's justified or not, but um, the Obama presidency has, has clearly not been, for a lot of people, what they hoped it would be. Um, and so, as a result, I think you're seeing a dampening of that effect. I'm not completely convinced, depend, you know, regardless of what happens in this election, I'm not completely convinced that all that analysis is wrong. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot sloppier and a lot less definitive. Well, it, I, I recall uh, when Karl Rove was famously quoted after the 2000 election as talking about, you know, a couple of decades right. of Republican dominance that were likely to follow, uh, and we know what happened to that. And uh, I, similarly, uh, we, we, we've seen the same kind of predictions with the Obama presidency as he was elected. I think all of what you said is, is absolutely true. I think there's something else going on, which is that the, the because of the, the culture that we live in, the, the sort of immediate gratification uh, culture that we, 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 we now have evolved into, because of the 24-hour media cycles, that, um, uh, that people are going, they're going to be let down very quickly. They, they want things to happen. They want them to happen now. They want them to happen quickly. And it doesn't happen that quickly. And so people uh, uh, get their hopes raised, and then, then they don't get the sort of change that they expected. Uh, and then they instantly want to change, uh, and they want something new. And they don't have the patience to sort of see things through. To, to, you know, it, it, it takes a you know, look at Johnson and other presidents and the sort of time it took to achieve the sort of legislative accomplishments and sort of change they wanted to. It took sometimes decades. Uh, but now we want things to happen immediately, and when they don't, uh, people are, uh, voters are let down, they express a great deal of dissatisfaction, and they immediately turn to something new. So uh, I think it's ironic uh, about Obama and his base because when you look at what he proposed to do during his campaign and what he's done, he's, he's followed through on quite yeah. a bit of it. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, the fact that the, the base is depressed and that sort of thing. It's also, it is historically normative that the, part, the, pre, the, power, the party in power would lose seats in a, in a, presidential, a non-presidential race. We were just talking to one of your colleagues earlier. That's, the, the aberrations are three times, two of them recent. One was Bush in 2002, and then in 96, and then in the 30s. Well, the other thing, too, that I think has happened is with, with Obama, and you, you got to this where I felt like people superimposed their wants and desires on Obama's candidacy when, in fact, if you paid attention to, to his candidacy and really read anything about his, his, his past, he was really the ultimate pragmatist. You know, mm -hmm. He was going to come in and make these sort of subtle changes. He was going to work on regulation. He was going to do a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. He wanted to get people around the table. So there's that. And then um, there's also this idea, and it's, I think it's coupled with this instant gratification thing, where we have instilled in our presidents almost this superhero like quality, and there's been some writing about that, which I found really interesting. And in fact, before the last election, there there was a, a, a book that really warned that whether it's McCain or Obama or Clinton, um, the idea that in this day and age, a president can walk into the White House and just solve all of these incredible problems that we face is unrealistic. And yet, the campaigns themselves market themselves that way. So they sort of encourage that thought until they're in office. And then they like to say, well, we can't do everything right away. Um, but it's just also, I think, 
part of this idea that you want things to happen right away. So you think, well, this yeah. personality, this guy's going to get it done. I don't know how many people have heard say that about Obama. Well, you know? I agree with that, too. The, the other thing I was going to say is that because of sort of the evolution of culture, politics, and media, but you layer on top of that the sort of challenges that we face today that are so enormous, just mm -hmm. foreign security, uh, uh, national security threats, foreign policy issues, coupled with all the domestic challenges with the, the economy, the environment, the fiscal situation. I, I don't think that we're ever going to see a president in our lifetimes that's going to be popular longer than about six months during their first honeymoon. That's going to be it. Right? And uh, it, it is just a, a an, it's really an impossible job. Uh, and I think that I, I'm probably a demographic cell of one who happens to have great sympathy for both President Obama and President Bush and, and also gets attacked by Keith Olbermann and Rush Limbaugh. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's to your credit, Mark. <laughs> I do want to follow up on that with both of you. Both of you have addressed reasons why progressives, the Democratic base, may not be totally pleased with the president. But he's also just hemorrhaged huge amounts of support among independents. What's caused that? Well, um, th there's, there's, um, this is a time which is, uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, economic distress creates enormous anxiety with all voters. And, um, but it, because voters have not been able to see the sort of change that they wanted to because they're economically distressed, they, the trust in government has completely broken down. Um, and the numbers are astonishing. Historical, we've never seen numbers like this ever. You know, like 80% of the people have just a zero lack of confidence or trust in the government anymore. Uh, and they think that the, gov the government uh, is not accountable. They think it's corrupt. They think it's run by moneyed interests and who can blame them. Uh, but for those reasons, people have also uh, defected from any kind of loyalty to the parties because they look at the parties in Washington. They see the hyper-partisanship. And, and I'm shocked by it because I go to Washington and I, and I, I as, as, as infrequently as possible, uh, because it's so poisonous, and you see the hyperpartisanship there. And, but if you if you live in Washington or just watch the cable news and and the news uh, political news from most of the sources that you get, you'd think that the whole country was like that. That we were all red and all blue. We were all right wing or left wing. Uh, that we were all hyperpartisan. That we that we were unwilling to recognize each other's differences or work together in a bipartisan way. And then I leave there and I come to places like this, and I discover it's just the opposite, that 80% of the people are really in the broad middle somewhere. And, and they, they feel so frustrated that they don't feel like there's a voice representing them. They don't feel like they're a part of the Republican Party that they see or the Democratic Party that they see on television. And that therefore, they're disassociating with the parties and they're describing themselves as independent. So, Today in this country, more people self-identify as independents than they do as Republicans or Democrats. And, and maybe what we'll save this for a, a question down the line, but I think that it's only conventional wisdom that, we, that a third party candidate hasn't won the presidency. And I think it's highly possible, maybe even probable, that it could happen in 2012. I mean, I used to joke about independent voters because I just decided they were fickle and you would watch the polls and literally from day to day you'd see these giant percentage drops and then you hear these men and women on the street interviews and there's somebody just they still can't decide and it and I found it somewhat inexplicable although now I I do think uh, you know and, and we, we've been talking about this earlier just this disaffection and frustration I think people just don't want to align themselves with anyone um, because there's a recognition that both sides are Maybe not, uh, my phone's ringing, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> you didn't uh, listen to Kristen, did you, David? Uh, <laughs> people saw me reach for it. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think people are just, they're, they're more convinced that, that nothing's getting done. Mm -hmm. So, it, and it's so polarized and it's so, every, every decision that's made is a political decision to solidify power. It's not about the best policy. It's not about the best idea. It's not about getting around a table and having a conversation. And when I come to places like this, I find that that's what people really want. They want a conversation. They want a debate. We all know we don't agree with one another. 
but I think we can agree that there are major issues that need to be tackled and that we live in a democracy that's constructed in such a way that we should be able to come up with at least some compromise. And uh, because people sense that that compromise doesn't exist, uh, I think they're just they're bailing from the system. And I, and I agree with you. I think that maybe more than ever in the last 20, 30 years, we might be in a position where we would see sort of an interesting third party or at least a third candidate emerge. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so bad that, that the, and so partisan that elected officials, if they demonstrate a willingness to work with the other party, they get branded as a heretic. And then they get put, they get the, 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 the right wing or left wing of the party puts up a candidate against them in the primary and they get, they get funded and often lose their races. So, so people who are, are consensus builders or pragmatic, common sense, looking for common ground are being driven out of both parties. And as a consequence of that, good people are leaving politics and it's not attracting good people in either. Uh, so it's, it, it, so, and it, the irony of all of this is that at a time when we have arguably some of the greatest challenges we've ever faced, we have a government that's absolutely paralyzed. And, and just to give you an example how this will play out in the very near future, first of all, things are so partisan that the Senate uh, refused to, to even study a fiscal, the, the looming fiscal crisis. <laughs> they literally uh, punted and said, we're not going to study this. And so President Obama had to appoint a private commission to study it because of the Senate, I mean, not only when they, when they couldn't make a decision, they couldn't agree to study it. So they got a private commission. Their findings are going to come out in December. And, I'm sh and it's made up of a lot of good people. And I'm certain that that, that commission will report out that we have to do two things. We have to raise more revenue and we have to cut spending. And then the next thing I assure you is going to happen is all the Republicans are going to say, we're not going to raise one single tax dime on the American people. And the Democrats will say, we're not going to cut a dime of spending. And there's going to be this impasse. And we, and we don't have anybody rewarding people in the middle for any sort of compromise, because if they do, they get, they, as I said before, they get punished by the right and the left. And there's, there's nothing in the middle, but, but there's some things I may talk about down the line about some things that are happening that I hope will change that. Or, or accused of, of stacking a deck or bias, because yeah. you'll see that as well. If somebody actually comes with a legitimate compromise, the next step is to tear the compromise down. And unfortunately now, particularly for this administration, when this administration tries to do it, they get torn down on both sides. Yeah. You know, he's on the left, he's seen as someone who's selling out. On the right, he's someone who's seen as trying to mask something that's much more liberal than he's presenting it to be. And he's in a box. Well, can I just ask for a show of hands on a question? I'm just curious about this. Whether or not you voted for Obama or not, how many people see him as more see him as a centrist, and then I'm going to ask how many people see him as more left leaning. How many people see Obama as a centrist Democrat, and how many people see him as a left leaning? Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that's part of being a good president too, is you you get it from both sides. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and yeah. uh, if you're confusing people about what you are, maybe that's a good sign. What about those you think about the Tea Party? I think that the Tea Party is a very real. Uh, response to uh, the environment. It has captured a lot of the energy. It's, it's, it's captured the entire intention of the media, uh, I, which I think is inordinate to what's really going on. Uh, I, I think that the, the Tea Party is a, uh, a, a real, it's not a manufactured movement. It is a, it, and, I, and I've been out to rallies and I've seen it. These are, these are lunch bucket folks who are really concerned about what's happening and uh, so the Tea Party as a broad umbrella has captured a lot of this, but I think it's a really small part of a bigger story. And, and the small part of the story that, that has attracted the media attention is that this, it's attracted the attention because they have had a big effect on the Republican primaries, and they've, they've won some huge upsets. And uh, th this is, a, these people are, uh, there are much, first of all, they're a broader group demographically than, than I think conventionally is thought about. Uh, but they are, they're just against the establishment. I mean, they're just, again, they're part of, they, they've lost trust. They don't believe in anything that's going on in Washington anymore. And so they just want to, they want wholesale change. And they don't care in what form it comes. And that's why you see the election 
of people like Christine O'Donnell, who just put out an ad yesterday saying that starts, I am not a witch. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so imagine a campaign where you have to come out and declare that you're not a witch. <laughs> okay? That's when you know things have gone south on you a little bit. I was actually on the Bill Maher show about three weeks ago, and uh, Bill Maher, Christine O'Donnell, this is the candidate who was nominated for the Senate in Delaware. Uh, in a huge upset, she beat a guy named Mike Castle who had been governor, congressman, forever, and just revered in that state as a, as a down the middle, centrist, pragmatic guy. Everybody loved him. But in this election, voters voted with their emotion instead of being very pragmatic because had they been pragmatic, uh, they would have voted for Castle because Castle would have, would have very likely won the the, uh, the, not just the nomination, but what would have won the Senate seat and therefore would have given the Republicans a majority in the Senate. But instead they elected a woman named Christine O'Donnell and on the Bill Maher show that I was on three weeks ago, which was his premiere show for the fall season, he related to the audience that he had had Christine O'Donnell on his show 22 times when he had an earlier program called Politically Incorrect. And he had all the old tapes from that program and that night, he previewed one of the tapes in which she declared that she dabbled in witchcraft. <laughs> and, uh, and then he decided to hold her hostage and said that until she came on his show again, he was going to continue to release these tapes <laughs> from those old programs, which he's continued to do. Um, but the bigger part, the, the, so the Tea Party has been a big shiny object for the media. It, it, it has, uh, and it is, it, it is going to have an impact on the Republic. It has had a already had a big impact on the Republican Party in the direction that it's going, and we'll continue to do that. But I think the bigger story is this whole issue of independence, because I think that the Tea Party is just a, a, a minor piece of the puzzle, the primary puzzle. In the general election, I think that there are not just millions, but I think there are a majority of Americans out there who, are, who want an alternative that's not the Tea Party. And I think there's actually a lot of the people in the Tea Party that don't really completely subscribe to the Tea Party, but it just happens to be the sort of the only movement out there right now. But I think, again, I think that there, there are some things going on right now some, uh, that, 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 that are going to make a third party bid very, not just possible, but probable in 2012. The, the mechanics of ballot access and that sort of thing, people are working behind the scenes to make sure that that is not a, uh, not a hurdle to a third party candidacy. And, and there are already people talking about running. So I think the real story is that is going to be the rise of independence and a, a real hunger for a rejection of the hyper-partisanship that in some way the, the Tea Party reflects. So the right. Tea Party is the first part of the story, but I think it's just the first part and it's going to be a much bigger story about independence. I mean, I, I feel like the Tea Party is sort of a repository for about 10 or 11 different points yeah. of view and, and flash points of anger. And, so I, and the media loves it because it's loud and it's angry and it's the closest thing we have to populist rage yeah. um, in a long time. But um, I'm sort of reticent to call it a movement. Um, I think it's a phenomenon. Uh, and out of that phenomenon, so essentially you're agreeing, but I think out of that phenomenon could grow some, some sort of movement. Um, but I think it's just, there's a couple things going on. There's a, there's a there's a wing of the Tea Partiers that I see as very economically conservative and sort of socially libertarian, and then you have a, almost a religious right element, um, and then you have this blue collar element. So there's all these different people at play, mm -hmm. um, and somebody's, I think, and then of course, underneath all that, there are ties to the Republican Party. I mean, there are worries among Republicans and among certain Democrats that this is just another, you know, another wing of the Republican Party. What does that mean? down the line when you're trying to attract independence, if that storyline gets any legs. So um, I think it's really fascinating for this election. Um, I actually don't know that we'll be uttering that phrase in four to six years. Maybe we will, but I think it's going to turn into something. What, uh, and Mark, I know you, you published a piece in the last day or two on this, but what, what do you guys think is the most likely outcome of the midterms? Well, the data seems to suggest that the Republicans are as worried as they can be or as excited as the Democrats get about certain polls. The Republicans will take, take a majority of the House. They won't in the Senate. And it looks like gubernatorially, they're going to see some big gains nationally. Um, I'm of the opinion, actually, that uh, it would be good for the country and good for the president. 
uh, for the Republicans to win the House. And I'm in the minority among my friends on that subject. You know, I bet but you are. I, but I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I, I think the Republicans will take the House. I mean, there's there's been a little bit of, again, this is just the physics of media, and it's very predictable that the last couple of days, are, oh, polls are closing, and it's really not going to be uh, the sort of big night for Republicans. I, I, I think the fundamentals are actually very clear that it's going to be a big Republican night. They're probably going to win the House. Uh, I think uh, probably not the Senate, but I think it's it's, I think it's the best thing politically that could happen for President Obama in terms of his reelection, um, and potentially for him getting something done. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. And and I mean it's the same thing that happened to Bill Clinton, and uh, he was able in in '96 to 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 point to the Republican Party and say, uh, you know, listen, we we have a shared responsibility here, and what have you done? And so if if there's a Republican House. Republicans will have to step up and put forward their plans, and so uh, by the time the election rolls around, President Obama will be able to whatever has been done or hasn't been done. There's going to be—it's not going to be totally his responsibility. The Republicans will bear some of the responsibility for whatever has or hasn't happened. Well, and he has a foil, and the foil's not his own party, which I really felt like during the health care debate. You know, some of the most aggressive debating at the end of the day, or at least the stuff that got into the mainstream media came from Democrats, yeah. centrist Democrats, who weren't willing to go certain places with the president. So, and that same thing happened, speaking of Clinton, you know, he had the same issues too, uh, early in his first term where, you know, the Democrats weren't exactly on his bandwagon. And, it, and it, so I, I think just having, having, having the other side having to take responsibility a little bit more than they're having to right now uh, could benefit. And voters them. generally like the idea of divided government. They're, they're just more comfortable with it generally. But to the point David was making earlier, the other, the really big story here really is not so much what happens at the federal level, but on the state level, there's huge gains for Republicans and the governorships and the state houses. And because uh, every 10 years, uh, the outcome of these elections relates to the census and to redistricting. So it's a very significant thing that's going to happen. So what we see happen in November will have long-term consequences, particularly in the states where the Republicans have really, are going to be amassing a lot of legislative power in the states, which will then have consequences for the federal elections. Both of you, um, I believe, on, on the basis of what you just said, you both feel that a Republican, that Republican control of the House is good for the president's reelection. Um, do you think he's going to reinvent himself like Clinton? Or is he going to create just continue this kind of huge standoff? I, I think, and there's been some signs that, um, you know, having checked off some of the, 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 the significant things that, that were important to his base on health care, uh, fiscal reform, uh, and, and a number of other uh, uh, component, uh, elements of his uh, campaign, I think he's really going to attack to the middle, and, and I think he's, uh, he's already given signals that he's going to really look at fiscal issues and trying to deal with the deficit, um, in very much in Clinton mode. Uh, and so I think it's going to be not big sort of, you know, social programs that he's going to be looking at, uh, or, uh, but I think it's going to be very targeted fiscal responsibility and accountability. I think there's going to be a whole basket of that stuff, and I suspect that in his State of the Union, that's going to be the real focus. That's my guess. I think that's probably true, and I also think he can get away with doing that with his base, because again, when you have a foil, you know the Republican House is going to be aggressive on certain issues, and and I think that in 2012 that could energize the base. You know, I, I don't think that Democrats aren't necessarily. I think they're on par with with where they usually are in terms of getting out the vote for a midterm election. I don't think the enthusiasm's down. I actually think Republican enthusiasm's higher. So I think that's, I, I, so I think yeah. that's what's, what's going on there. So I think he will become much more of sort of a, almost like a, you know, a governor of sorts, where he, he, he's going to be tr try to be even more pragmatic. And I, and I think one of the things he did successfully, I thought, during the health care debate, uh, people can disagree, but I thought one of his most successful strategies was calling the Republican leadership together and saying, OK, what would you guys do? I want to know what you guys would do because we got to do something. And I think he could probably pull that off 
more frequently and more legitimately, especially if they control a house. Okay. Let me ask you guys a, a kind of a series of questions and just get a brief comment from both of you about the 2012 election. Now, who's likely to be the Republican nominee or who should they nominate? Um, uh, what is, it will, uh, will uh, Secretary of State Clinton be on the ticket in place of Vice President Biden, which is Bob Woodward's big story today? And third, you mentioned something, Mark, I find fascinating. Is there going to be a third party candidate and who would that be? Or who could that be? Give us examples. Sure. So just address all three of those briefly. For okay, me. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think it's gonna be a fascinating election that the great thing about American politics is the conventional wisdom so often gets thrown out the window and, and we get surprised. So I think there's gonna be a lot of surprises. One of the things, I mean, there, there is a, the, the field is, is, a, is as many as 10 or more at this point in the Republican uh, primary of people who are really looking at it. You have the establishment candidates like Mitt Romney. Um, you've got um, uh, a lot of the people that ran last time. You've got some new people looking at it, like Senator John Thune from South Dakota, uh, Mitch Daniels, uh, Haley Barber, governor of, of Mississippi, uh, a number of others, um, Tim Pawlenty from Minnesota. Um, but uh, I think it is increasingly uh, possible, and not just possible, even probable at this point that Sarah Palin is going to run for president. And she cracked the door open in a speech in Iowa a couple of weeks ago. And, and once you crack that door open, I've been around this uh, before and I've seen it happen. It, once that door's open, it's almost impossible to shut uh, for a lot of reasons that I could go into. But, um, and then when you look at what happened in, De in Delaware in some of these recent elections and what she did with her endorsements, she had a very successful endorsement strategy. She, she's increased her leverage, increased her power in the Republican Party. She continues to be an absolute crack for the media. Uh, they, they, they can't get enough and they can't stop. Um, uh, but when you see what happened with the, with the sort of Tea Party voters and what's happening in the Republican primaries, those are Sarah Palin voters. The people that elected Christine O'Donnell are Sarah Palin voters. So if, if, you, if, you, uh, if we presume that that, that, that that appetite is still gonna be there in, in a year or two down the line, which I think it will be, uh, and that these people are still activated, uh, it's very easy to see how, if you look at this picture, you have Sarah Palin and say eight or 10 other guys running in a primary in Iowa, which will be the first contest. Okay, so first of all, she's the only woman in a field of 10. Second of all, she's got Tea Party support and kind of, the, and she also secures that sort of social right wing of the Republican primary, which is at least a third of the vote. The only other potential candidates that are going to take that vote are Mike Huckabee, who I don't think is going to end up running because he's got a big issue with a pardon clemency problem, or uh, Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania, who just doesn't have nearly the appeal that somebody like Sarah Palin does. So she could probably win Iowa. She could probably win South Carolina, which has the same kind of, you know, very socially conservative vote there. And in the Republican primary, if you win Iowa and South Carolina, you're, you're on your way to the Republican nomination. So I think, it, I think that there's a... There's a case that can be made that Sarah Palin can win the Republican nomination, which I think will uh, add only further fuel to a third party candidacy. I think a third party candidacy could be possible with other nominees, but it'll be absolutely possible and highly probable if it's Palin versus Obama. So third party, who might that be? As I said, I think that there are significant, I know that there are significant efforts underway to pave the way so that if somebody wants to run for a third party, it's gonna be possible. Now, who, who, who might those candidates be? I, I think if it were possible, I think we're gonna see a lot of people who might do it. Um, but the, the, the main people who are being talked about right now are Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, Donald Trump uh, also is talking about it. Um, uh, but that reaction might be telling. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very telling, but... Um, Probably could cut the federal workforce pretty good, though, couldn't Yeah, you? for sure. <laughs> Lots uh, of experience with that. But, the, but people talk about uh, uh, General Petraeus uh, as being on a ticket with one of those. You know, it could be a ticket of, of some combination of Petraeus and Bloomberg. Or, but but, but Evan, Evan Bayh is a guy who's, who's leaving the Senate because he's sort of fed up with the partisan politics. But he's the sort of person who might look at something like that as well or being part of a ticket with somebody. 
So those are a few of the people that are being talked about, but, but I think as this becomes a reality, and it's going to become a reality, uh, I think we'll see all sorts of people express an interest in it. I'll answer sort of the second part of your question, which was, it, would it be a mistake? Or you know, would their choice be a mistake or a good thing? I, I am not saying this because I'm from Minnesota, because I am not a fan. However, um, I think, and Mark, you may totally disagree with me, but I thought one of the big mistakes uh, the McCain campaign made was not only choosing Sarah Palin, which in, in retrospect you can prove was a bad choice. Um, I think they would have been smart to go with Tim Pawlenty, who is who, stepping down as the governor of, of Minnesota. I think he would have made McCain potentially, uh, I think he potentially could have, especially given what happened with the economy in the wake of that decision, given him a real shot because he is uh, the sort of Republican, in my opinion, that has a similar appeal to a George Bush. Um, he can communicate with, with, he's seen as a sort of person that can communi communicate with the common man. Um, he has some fairly conservative views that might not be all that palatable for um, independents, especially moderate independents, and yet he'll be able to sell them. He can sell them in such a way that they don't seem that way. His, his election in Minnesota the first time around proved that. And I actually think he'd be a tough presidential candidate. I don't think he has a shot to get the nomination. But I would be more scared of him as a Democrat than I would be of Palin. Um, so mm -hmm. I think they would be wise to do something like that. As for Biden and Clinton, uh, I don't believe that the, I don't believe that Biden will be replaced simply because, and, and this is more based on anecdotal evidence on my part, but I just think Biden helped Obama a lot. Uh, in the latter stages of that campaign with older male independent voters. Um, and th they're going to be few and far between in the first place. So I, I don't think you'd want to uh, sacrifice that. And I just think she's too much of a lightning rod, even though she's served now as secretary. I just, she, she's too much, it's, it's just red meat. I wouldn't do it. What do we have to do to change politics as usual? And the president said he was going to do it, but he hasn't been successful. You know, one of the interesting things about that, uh, that I, uh, some, some columnist ought to, and maybe you might take a look at this, uh, David, uh, is, would be to, to go and look at the speeches of, uh, the early presidential speeches of Barack Obama and George Bush. They were actually very similar particularly in, in the, with this notion about changing the culture of Washington and changing the tone in Washington. And it's been fascinating to me to watch them both go in with absolutely genuine intent to do that and absolutely hitting a wall. Uh, some of the circumstances are different, but, uh, but, but, the, but the outcome has been the same. Um, and uh, I could go on for a long time about the reasons why it's like that, but there's no question that, that that it is that kind of an environment that it's so difficult to try and govern in any kind of a bipartisan fashion. But, but politics is a uh, response to the market and uh, uh, the hyperpartisanship has been going on because as I said they get rewarded by right-wing radio or cable television and it won't be until the, the middle of America uh, expresses itself in a organized fashion that things are likely to change. Now, uh, I'm seeing a, lo a lot of evidence that there were a lot of people who sort of considered themselves in the middle who uh, until now were just apathetic. They just said, well, I just, you know, I just don't care. Uh, I, you know, I feel disenfranchised, but I really don't care about it. Now they care because things are, t the issues are too big, it's too important. Now people are engaged and they're saying, you know, uh, I really want to find a way where I can have an impact and, and somehow have my voice reflected. So there are, there are lots of things going on, but let me just name one. There's, and I, I have to confess that this is something that I'm involved in, but uh, there's an effort called No Labels, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to launch in December, uh, December 13th in New York, and it's going to have 1,000 people from across the country. And I've been going around the country talking to people about this idea, which is, which is simply uh, giving voice in some way to the millions of Americans who just feel completely disenfranchised by the parties or by the hyperpartisanship on the right or the left. And uh, the idea is that this would be uh, create a vehicle where people could express, uh, where we could reward people who work together, who 
had the audacity to meet with members of the other party uh, who were willing to work together on legislation. Uh, so it's a, you can go to nolabels.org or no labels on Facebook and find out a little bit about it. But, but these are the kind of things that I see happening around the country that suggest to me that, that people really are fed up and are, are willing to do something about it, are willing to sign up, willing to get involved. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, I, you know, I've been watching this for a long time, and I just think the appetite and the hunger, the passion uh, is so palpable out there, and I see it everywhere I go, uh, for some really constructive change. People are just fed up with the process and fed up with the hyperpartisanship and the poison environment in Washington. That, that has handicapped both of the last couple of presidents, and they, they don't think it's fair, and they don't think it's right, and they want to do something about it. And I agree with that, and I, I tend to be at the risk of sounding Pollyanna or, or, uh, or sort of repeating uh, cliches. I think it is a grassroots sort of thing that needs to take place, and I think it needs to take place in our schools. We have to teach each other, once again, how to have conversations, how to have true debate, um, how to challenge one another, uh, not what we believe, but on ideas themselves and whether or not they're valuable um, and how to proceed. We have to learn to meet with the neighbors that we disagree with. We have to go to school board meetings and city council meetings and we have to go to churches where not everybody believes the exact same thing, especially politically. We have to start to reform um, a base of community that, that, that is more diverse and not so exclusionary. Um, Practically speaking, I think there are ways to pressure change. You know, um, politics is, is driven by the market and media is driven by the market. Um, so this media that's rewarding these candidates is also being rewarded with a lot of money. And I hear a lot about media bias. We were talking about this last time I was here. And I, I've become convinced that there is less of a liberal and a conservative bias in the media than there is a, a money bias. And that is to say that whatever is most successful, whatever sells commercials, and whatever draws viewers is what you're going to see. Um, and you are those viewers. We are those viewers. And so when we really don't like something, we have to be vocal, but we have to be even more vocal and more out front when we do like something, when something is done well, when reporting is done fairly. Um, when there is reasoned discussion, um, when, there are, when there is programming in newspapers and magazines, you, you know, you have to go out and buy those newspapers and magazines. And, and I speak, you know, like you, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in this. I work for a magazine. That our goal is to create discussion. And what we've been telling people as a, as a marketing ploy, because it is the truth, is like, hey, we can do this as long as you support us. Um, and when you don't support us, we go away, and the sort of media that we want to do goes away. And I also think that people need to, if people are truly frustrated with this partisanship uh, and this vitriol, they need to get behind those leaders who have the willingness and courage to stand up to it. And I mean in their own parties. Mm -hmm. You know, there need to be leaders that emerge on the moderate side of, of both wings of the political spectrum here who say, look, enough. You know, enough of the name calling. Uh, enough of the silliness, you know, just because someone questions a certain policy doesn't mean they're unpatriotic. Just because somebody has a certain belief system doesn't mean they're a redneck or they're stupid. You know, throw out these labels and reward people. Um, and I'll be completely honest, I, I don't know how I feel about Senator McCain right now. I haven't paid that much attention, but one of the things I found attractive about him um, early in that race is he struck me as the kind of guy that could maybe be that person. I certainly felt that way about Obama. Um, but you can't, we can't abandon those folks um, uh, when they have the courage to do that. So it really is, I mean, I really think it has to be a movement. It's not going to be a top-down movement. That's never going to happen. There's too much money. Um, there's too many reasons that, to stop that. But I, but I do think people can have a real influence. And something like this, you know, just this is, to me, more conversation more people getting together. I know everybody in this room doesn't agree. We don't agree on a lot of issues, but I know we could sit down and have a really good conversation about how to handle some of these, some of these problems that we face. Okay, we're going to open up to your uh, questions, and we've got a couple of uh, students, Lexi and Luke, who will circulate. And Lexi, you got a question up here. If you want to get this lady, and Luke, if you want to look for somebody over on this side, if there's anybody on this side that has a question, raise your hand, and we'll get you next. Author, 
Is it on? Yes. Author Jeff Charlotte uh, has two books called The Family and C Street. And they um, expose this uh, secret pseudo-religious group which uh, aims to surreptitiously take over the US government. Now, is it really insidious? And why hasn't the mainstream media alerted the public more to this danger if it exists in our uh, country? And also here in Kansas, when um, Sam Brombeck is one of the uh, part of that conspiracy. I'm not familiar with that. Are either of you familiar I with actually, that? Actually, I've read The Family. Uh, I found it a fascinating book. I, I thought it was, uh, it was written for dramatic effect, but I also thought it was well reported. Uh, went back deep into history and sort of established some ties. Um, you know, the, the book did get some coverage, uh, and this, the whole C Street thing has gotten coverage in part because of Mark Stanford's uh, involvement. Um, and so there has been writing about it. I thought it was interesting, and I don't know what to make of this. I've been meaning to track it down. Um, the New Yorker just did a piece about this, and it wasn't Charlotte who wrote it. Um, it was a reporter they assigned to it. And it was sort of an interesting piece in the sense that it really didn't get into a lot of this, this idea that it was conspiracy theory. It really, it was more just seen as sort of a, kind of a regular political group. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> it's the kind of thing, for me, when I read the book, it got me thinking, and I thought there were some really interesting connections. Um, I wasn't utterly convinced when I finished it that there's a full-blown conspiracy at work. But there's clearly, there's clearly an influence that this group has on leadership. Um, you know, they're the people behind the National Prayer Breakfast uh, each year. Uh, they bring in world leaders, and they have a definite dogma about how leaders are supposed to interact with the world. Now, what I will finally say is that Charlotte approaches this as his premise is that their intentions in and of themselves are evil. And so if you believe that their intentions are evil, then it all feels like a conspiracy. On the other hand, if you felt like what they want to accomplish as leaders, and they have a very specific way they think that um, responsible leaders lead, then instead of seeing it as a conspiracy, you would see it as a noble effort to uh, make uh, our politicians behave more. Um, morally. Yeah, and, and the National Prayer Breakfast is a wonderful event. Um, but I, 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 there, there has been, and I, I, don't, I don't remember the sources, but there has been some additional reporting from legitimate mainstream media on, on, the, uh, on the organization. And uh, uh, so, uh, it, I mean, it, it, there, there's been a lot of light sh shined on on the organization, in addition to the book, uh, there's been a number of articles. I remember seeing several of them that go into a, a great amount of detail. And again, I, 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 I'm not sure whether there's a conspiracy beneath all this or not. But, but one thing that is clear is that a number of their members, including Mark Sanford, that you mentioned, but also Senator Ensign uh, from uh, Nevada, who's who's been caught in a in a you know a very messy uh, scandal that are contrary to the, the views of the organization. So uh, the organization itself has, has, been, has been handicapped by the behavior of some of the members that, that in, in contrast to sort of the, the ethical standards of the organization. But, but the one, I think the one thing I can say is there's, there's a huge spotlight on it now and you don't have to worry about whatever they're doing because they're not gonna oh, get away no. with it. <laughs> I mean, one could make the argument, I mean, I, you know, it may be one of the last places for, for all the right or all the wrong reasons, but it might actually be one of the last places where people from different political stripes are getting together, socializing, praying, dining, because certainly the, the, no one in the Senate's doing that anymore. I mean, yeah. they literally hate each other. So there is, you know, Hillary Clinton's involved with the prayer breakfast. There are Democrats that have stayed at this house on C Street. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know enough to conclude one way or the other, but I mean, that would be another way to look at it. It's like, geez, you know, at least these guys can get together and break bread because um, that's not happening too much in Washington. Okay, do we have a question over on this side? Luke, you got somebody? Yeah, to follow up on the uh, Sarah Palin uh, thing, uh, from all the blogs, everyone seems to think that she's going to announce on uh, Ronald Reagan's birthday in his library for president. 
Do, is it that little early for her? Does she have the substance to lay claim to the, the Reagan mantle? And to follow up on the Woodward thing, would, would the switch from Biden to Secretary of State and uh, Hillary to Vice President, would that kind of suck all the oxygen out of the Tea Party uh, movement or phenomenon? If it, uh, two parts there. I hadn't heard that about Palin, but uh, it doesn't, that doesn't strike me, strike me as logical, at least in terms of, of her actually planning a date for an announcement. I don't, I don't think that she's that far along in her decision-making process that she'd actually be thinking about a date to announce. Um, although I'm glad to be enlightened, I, I just haven't read the particular blogs that you're talking about. The, but there is a, I mean, there's a, whether, I mean, she ought to do it artfully. I don't think she should do it uh, explicitly, but the parallels between with her and Reagan, if, I mean, if those of you who are old enough to remember, Reagan got a lot of the same kind of criticism that Sarah Palin's getting, and it wasn't taken seriously. He was, you know, he was branded an actor, not a serious player, not a substantive guy. A lot of the same things that people are saying about Sarah Palin. So strategically, it's absolutely in her interest to subtly lay down that predicate that there are some parallels there, uh, but. Um, but I'd, I'd be surprised if she's actually made any real decisions about announcing. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know how the, 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 the Biden-Hillary thing would have any impact on the, on the, on the Tea Party uh, issue, except to maybe inflame it even more, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, because I just see them both as polarizing figures, and I, I think the Palin move, well, I don't disagree that it's possible or even probable, but I think if if what we're talking about tonight is true, that the middle is sort of increasingly frustrated with the way people do business. I don't know that Palin has done a very good job of really separating herself uh, from the system. Maybe she has, but I, I think a lot of people still view her as, I mean, she's, she got on the national stage as the Republican nominee for vice president. Yeah. So she is an institutional political face. and. Uh, I just think that she'll, if there is in fact, a, as Friedman likes to say, a radical middle that's ready for something new, I'm not sure she's the person any more than I think Hillary Clinton helps you get those folks uh, attracted to your ticket. Yeah, I mean, H H H politically it wouldn't make much sense for Obama to do that because even though she is in actuality more centrist probably than Obama is, she is such a polarizing figure that it, I think that it would actually really stir up the Tea Party and certainly the conservatives. Uh, but the only thing that gives that some legitimacy is that it's, it's widely known that, that Biden always wanted to be Secretary of State. Mm. I mean, he really was a foreign policy expert. That's really what he, that was really his ambition was to be Secretary of State. That'd be really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> now, a, dip, a diplomat to the court. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to have somebody over there actually saying what he thinks. Yeah, that's you know? true. <laughs> I thought, I imagine we'd have some foreign policy you crisis. Another, another question? Uh, recently, the, uh, I believe it was the news director for CNN was fired and replaced. and. I was rem I found remarkable, and I was going to ask you both if the numbers were correct, and then have a follow-up question on that. That the viewership for CNN had fallen into the upper hundreds of thousands, around six or seven hundred thousand, but noted that Fox was about two and a half million, and MSNBC somewhere in between. Those numbers seem remarkably small to me relative to our population. One, are those numbers correct? And if they are, and they're largely just preaching to the choir, people who already agree with what they're saying, is their influence exaggerated? And it's just somebody that people who are in the game watch, and so they get fired up about it? That, that is a great question, and you're absolutely right. And I find it astonishing. Because I look at these, these, these uh, ratings, which uh, are published, you know, you can, you can find them anytime you want. But you're right. I mean, uh, you know, a great night for cable television, for, for Fox, or MSC, or CNN, O'Reilly, uh, who's like the number one political show on cable television on Fox, I think a, a really big night is maybe a million and a half or something like that. Um, you know, Keith Olbermann was like 800,000 or something, and then you're right, CNN's down at like 200,000. But those are minuscule numbers compared to the population. You're absolutely right. It's a, and yet, think of the, the, the dominant influence that it has in the political dialogue. And I mean, if, if, if you didn't say those numbers, and we, we just, and I, and I didn't know them, and you just asked me to guess what they were, 
I think that they were you know, larger than broadcast television. They were at least 20, 30 million people watching this stuff, but it's not. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really great question because it is an inordinate amount of influence for a tiny sliver segmented audience that has a huge impact on the, uh, on the environment. You're absolutely right. And the, and the segmented audience, because it is segmented, it's hard targeted. It's a valuable audience. And so as a result, more, more and more, quote unquote, mainstream organizations who are in the business of news or infotainment or whatever you want to call it are copying that style because it means dollars. If you, you know, the more targeted your demographic, the more valuable the demographic is. And so the genius of Fox is they know exactly who's watching it. And that's who they cater to. Same with MSNBC programming and MSNBC. They know exactly who they're getting. And I think you're seeing more and more energy and resources spent instead of on gathering news uh, you know, and populating foreign bureaus or what have you, more and more energy and time is going into what decisions can we make? Who, who's going to replace Larry King so that we can make sure that we can find a demo that's attractive to our advertisers? Uh, and then we can make money. And so their influence is not only political, and I, I think I do agree. I mean, I argue with my friends who, I have one friend who watches Fox too much. He's obsessed. And I just have to tell him to settle down. Uh, it's going to be OK. There's not that many people watching it. But it is true that their influence goes beyond simple politics. I mean, I think they have a deep cultural influence. They've, they've, I mean, without Fox, you wouldn't have an MSNBC. So MSNBC, as it stands now, is spawned from Fox. Yeah. It's a response. Uh, Lou Dobbs. That'd be a good T-shirt. Whatever happened to Lou Dobbs? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna ask. Where's Lou? Yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Please wait well, for the microphone. Uh, yeah, I'll answer that. Uh, I, well, he he s sort of got fired from CNN. Uh, as you, re I mean, he was a, a a very straight business correspondent and uh, uh, and had a business show, and then. He increasingly got political, and then increasingly got sort of shrill, particularly on immigration, and became this sort of wild populist that uh, that just sort of went off the reservation and uh, got very unpredictable. Particularly for CNN's, you know, he would have been more appropriate on MSNBC ultimately. But it was sort of surprising to watch his evolution because, you know, he was sort of a straight down the middle business guy, and then just got. So uh, I think the answer is that he got sort of out of the CNN box of comfort for the network, and they let him go. Uh, but but it is, it's interesting that he hasn't resurfaced somewhere. I feel like a lot of the, in, in just watching a lot well, of has he? Oh, is he? Really? Mm. As an actor? Huh. Is he a criminal or a? <laughs> <laughs> is he a sheriff? <laughs> oh, okay. That's nice. We have a question on this side. Somebody want to get this gentleman. What do you guys need to stay on the right, one on the left? I don't want the people on the left accusing me of favoring the people on the right. Uh, thanks to uh, both of you for coming. Uh, about the Afghanistan and Iraq situations, what, can it be known now what effect that will have on the 2012 presidential campaigns, or is that Will it be a significant factor? I, I would say that it, it has the potential to be a factor in the sense that it creates problems for Obama's base uh, with progressives on the left. Uh, I, I think that they are very unhappy about the situation in Afghan Afghanistan uh, and that that could become a real uh, you know, source of well, it is, a, it is. It currently is a problem. Uh, and if there's not any real resolution by the 2012 race, I think that it will have the impact of suppressing enthusiasm for voters on the left, which Obama will need. And I think it's a factor now. You know, I think it's also a factor in this election in terms of that base not being enthusiastic. It's certainly yeah. been one of their, which I also find interesting. Going back to you know my vision of Obama when he ran for president, he was very clear that this is what he was going to do. So I, I do find it interesting that. There are people on the left that have used words like betrayal because, in my in my mind, I don't think he betrayed anyone. He just simply did what he said he was going to do. I, I, I also think that whether or not this administration will do this or not, I, I still think there's an opportunity to to define the mission much more clearly 
for the American people and to let them know what success or failure is supposed to look like. Um, and even if it's not achieved by that time, if, I, I mean, I, one of my problems with it, I mean, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Again, I wasn't surprised that it happened, but I have never thought that this, and one of my disappointments in the Obama administration on this front is that I don't think they've done a very good job of articulating what, what needs to be done and what they think can be done. And perhaps it's because they don't know. Um, but, I, but I think they have to, 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 to stop that from being a real issue, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to come up with a different way to communicate with the American people about it. This is a footnote to that. I, one of the interesting things about Obama's candidacies, and I saw some of this, I had the opportunity to do international elections and worked in South America and Africa and, and some other places as well, particularly in emerging third world, emerging third world countries where they were have, experiencing democracy for the first time. With Obama, people just heard what they wanted to hear. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they just, whatever their hopes and dreams were, they just assumed that Obama reflected that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's part of the reason his, his candidacy was so powerful, is that people just literally believed that whatever they believed in, he was going to do it for them. And it didn't matter what he actually said. Well, he would use these words, hope and change. Well, yeah. what does change mean to you? You know, when you hear that word, you think of one thing, and when I hear that word, yeah. I think of it completely thought, what, They defined it exactly the way they wanted to hear it, yeah. Okay, right here, Luke. So, we're one month, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, we're one month out from the election. And my question is, what role will campaign finances play in the outcome? And I've just recently heard that there are foreign monies being solicited into the campaign coffers. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not I, I'm, we talked a little bit about this earlier. I, I'm not sure about the foreign money piece because as, as far as I know, the, the current election laws don't allow for actual direct foreign donors, but um, I, I think it's a travesty, and I think this is part of the problem. This is why people are so frustrated with the process, is they, there was a recent Supreme Court decision uh, uh, called Citizens United, in which the, the, the courts basically came down, this is the way I des des define, describe it, it, basically what the court said was the corporations don't have enough influence and don't have enough money in the political process. And therefore, or, and and don't have enough voice, um, and so and basically said that corporations have now the opportunity to have unlimited voice and impact and influence and money in the process, and we're beginning to just now see the stories reported about the impact of that decision on the money in politics. Some of which we see, some of which we don't, some of which we'll never know the donors for, um, <coughs> and it's swamping the political process. One example, just one example of many. But we, but we have a situation in which, <laughs> in which shadowed interests, and it's on both sides, mm -hmm. that has to be more from the Republicans right now, but there was more from the Democrats in the last election, uh, are able to spend unlimited amount of money, take the Colorado Senate race, for example. The Republican candidate in that race since the primary has spent a million two. The Democratic candidate has spent about two million dollars. Other interests have spent six million. So they're spending two, three times as much as the actual campaigns themselves. And we don't know now and, and, and won't know ever who some of these people are. And it's outrageous. Uh, I mean, it has taken our political process hostage when, when outside interests are outspending the actual campaigns themselves by a factor of three, four, or five to one. And it does, and it masks allegiances. You know, going back to your question about this book, The Family. Um, the thing that I find fascinating about that book isn't necessarily whether or not there's a conspiracy theory at play or how much power or power they don't have as, as sort of this organized thing. But what's interesting is the allegiances, the unusual allegiances you see in this organization that, they're, that they, they're able to coalesce around a certain topic. Same thing here. I mean, if we, people's allegiances before they get elected and after they get elected are I believe are directly affected by who gives them large sums of money. There's no question. So right. if you don't know who those people are, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to find that out, even for trained professionals, reporters who are out there trying to do it, it's very hard to find out who these folks are. Um, I think it's a disservice to the American voter uh, to hide those influences because really, you, when you elect someone, you're not only electing them, you're electing all the people that, that are behind them. 
And if I could just tell one anecdote about that. And it, it's, it's it, with every administration, by the way, you see this, the biggest bundlers of money become what? Ambassadors. You know, look at all the ambassadors. They are either down the line, the people who gave the most money to the campaigns. I worked in a, for a governor of Texas years ago, and the campaign manager for that race became the appointments secretary, the patronage chief. Uh, now, in Texas today, as it was 30 years ago, there are no limits to how much money you can give a candidate for governor. You can give $10 million if you want to. So that appointments person was meeting with his counterpart from Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, they have very strict campaign finance laws that, to me, make a lot of sense. And the guy from Wisconsin was informing his counterpart from Texas about the laws. And he explained that in Wisconsin, you can only give $500 to a candidate for, for governor. Which just shocked the guy from Texas. And he sat there and he thought for a minute. And he said, $500? That's the maximum you can give to a candidate for governor? The guy from Wisconsin said, yes. The guy from Texas thought again for a second and looked at him and dead serious said, well, so how do you know who to appoint? <laughs> <laughs> And that, my friends, is the problem. <laughs> well, and, and in terms of, of, of doing something about that problem, too, we were, we were talking about this earlier, too. It cuts both ways. And sometimes it, 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 when you have the, you know, the Supreme Court's decision conspiring against you, it's difficult sometimes to force the politicians to be held accountable on this. Or to, 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 but, but the corporations that give the money, they need to be exposed for giving money to certain candidates who support certain things and defend that in the public sphere. So, for instance, we were talking about this, you know, Target Corporation uh, gave money to a, a, a foundation in Minneapolis that then gave money to a very conservative uh, Republican candidate who was against um, same-sex uh, marriage and same-sex rights in the state. And when people found out in Minneapolis, which is a fairly progressive city, and Minnesota, which is unusually progressive, usually, that this company that, is, that has their home base there was giving money to this conservative candidate who had these beliefs, suddenly, uh, you know, all this heat got on the target, and Target pulled out the money. So while the politician didn't change the way, or the political system didn't change necessarily, putting pressure on the company made a difference. So that's a way, again, you know, speaking about what can we do, those are things that we can do, is we can, we can be more proactive and try to figure out uh, where this money's coming from. And, and if we disagree uh, with it, go at it that way. And there's some legislation that, uh, unfortunately, I doubt will ever get passed. But it did pass out of a significant committee. It's called the Fair Elections Act, which would change the way we fund election to a public funding system paid for by non-taxpayer revenue, which would which would compel people to get small dollar donations matched by a, a, a fund, which would, which would help. But we really need much more radical reform, which unfortunately Congress is never going to reform itself in this regard. And it, it may require a much more dramatic action, like some sort of constitutional amendment that goes through the states. We have time for one last question. I think this gentleman right here, did you have a question, sir? Um, regarding the polarization, um, that we're experiencing in Washington. Um, I guess the, the question I had, do you see any non-governmental, um, not necessarily Republican, not necessarily Democratic Party organizations being someone who could be a catalyst towards some of the issues that need to move forward in the midst of the deadlock between the two parties? Mm -hmm. Um, is there any sort of uh, organization or, or groups of people who are starting to push that forward now um, outside of the two parties? Yeah. Well, um, uh, I want to once again mention nolabels.org and no labels on Facebook. Check that out. Mm -hmm. But one, one interesting thing that's, that's happened as a result, uh, one of the outcomes of the paralysis, and this is something that President Clinton talks about very passionately and, and very persuasively, is that there's an interesting phenomena going on as, the, as government agencies and political parties continue to be paralyzed and incapable of, of, of uh, coming together and solving the problems that we've got. Increasingly, NGO, non-governmental organizations are filling the gap and filling the vacuum. And so there's remarkable things going on, not just in this country, but around the world. Uh, it, because 
the, 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 it's, it's, it's inspirational to see what people are doing, but they're, but they're doing it outside of government. They're just, they, they're tired of beating their head on the wall with government. So non-governmental, in fact, there's an article about the Clinton Global Initiative the other day that was basically saying that he's doing more than the United Nations now with what he's, and it's, he's doing fabulous things with it. So uh, as government continues, again, it's the markets adapting, and what the market's saying was if government won't do it, we're going to find somebody else and some other organizations that will. And again, that's the, the sort of thing that you can support. You can not only support monetarily and, and enthusiastically, but you, there are media organizations and there are uh, academic institutions that cover what these groups are doing, pay attention to it, uh, keep statistics, in some cases fund. Um, and because those things are happening, you know, there, I mean, it's sort of interesting. I, I had the benefit, I, I want to say this sort of as, a, as an end note, I had the benefit of sitting in a library uh, our office is, gener we generate our magazine out of a library of, of independent alternative publications. We get something like 1,500 of them uh, a year, different titles. And it's, it, you, it, for me, I'm in a unique position to be very hopeful because not only do I see great journalism being done in these magazines, when I keep hearing from my peers in the mainstream media that there's no good journalism being done, I see beautifully written, well-reported, in-depth, thoughtful journalism. Um, but I also read about all kinds of things that are going on around the globe, initiatives, great ideas, great visions, scientific uh, discoveries, people getting together um, to, to help communities. Um, there's, there's all these things going on, again, that, using that word, the grassroots, that don't get paid attention to when we spend our time watching people yell at each other about big political ideas. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of these folks that um, maybe even are calling themselves independents. They've abandoned the system and they're out there trying to help their neighbor, trying to help people. And uh, you can take some solace from that. I, for one, threw my, almost threw my radio at the wall back in June because I was already tired of the election coverage. I get tired of it very quickly. Mm. Uh, um, now, I fixed my radio and I'm listening to it again. <laughs> but. Uh, but I, but I need that library, and I need to know that behind all this bickering, um, there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great work. Uh, if I, just one final note. First of all, I want to thank you for having me here. And, uh, but I just want to say that uh, I, I hope that whatever we do in politics, that we create an environment in which we can get more people like Senators Dole, uh, because they are great examples of real, true servants of democracy, and the country would be a whole lot better off if we had more people like them. Okay. David, Mark, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure.